Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all, and a very big welcome to our visitors this morning. I'm not even going to try and remember your names. I have been told, but it's gone in one year and out the other. But you're all very welcome, and I hope we have a good time as we share this last day of the year together. Uh, shall we start off this, this, uh, this morning with uh, the good old hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Thank you. Shall we bow together and speak to God in prayer? <clears throat> Our gracious God and Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that we are conscious of that one who is described as the great Jehovah, the great I Am, the one who has time and space within his grasp. And Lord, as we come to you and we look forward to the coming year and look back on the past year. Lord, we pray that we may know your presence and your guidance with us in all that we do. We are conscious, Lord, that we look ahead to a world that is uncertain and unknown. There are so many ponderables that simply escape our understanding, but thank you, Lord, that you are there, that you have all things within your grasp, you are the sovereign, great God of eternity. Help us, Lord, to trust in you in all things. We do thank you, Lord, for this time together. Pray that you would be near to us and bless us as we share your word and consider it together. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to each one of us as individuals. And we pray, Lord, that you would just draw near to us now. We do remember those who are going through difficult times. We especially remember families who are mourning the loss of a loved one at the moment. And we do pray that you would be near to them, that they may know your peace and your comfort at this difficult time. And so, Father, we ask now that you would draw near to us and speak to us as we commit this time into your care in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right, well, um, I'm thinking I should get Alfie out, shouldn't I? Yeah, I think we should. I think Abigail wants to join in. You don't mind her joining in? Okay. Hello, Abigail. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, you want to say hello to Alfie, do you? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> okay, it was a fit. She's more interested with over there. Okay, right, Alfie, well, we're, uh, we're on the last day of the year today. Yeah, you're feeling sad. I thought you might be. Yeah, Christmas is over. Yeah, and how many sleeps is it to Christmas now? 358. I didn't know you were counting. Okay, fine. Well, I'm sure you've had a good Christmas. You've had lots to eat. And there's nothing left. Okay. Well, never mind. We've got the new year coming. And uh, are you going to make some resolutions? No. Okay. Um, any particular reason you're not making any resolutions? When you don't make resolutions, you can't break them. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a little puzzle for you, okay? Are you happy to have a little puzzle? You know the answer to everything. Okay. Well, if you look on the table next to us, we've got four candles. Now, this isn't a TV comedy sketch, okay? <laughs> there are four separate candles there. I want you to tell me what they've all got in common. Yes, I know they're all candles, mm -hmm. but what else have they got in common? They're all different, yeah. Okay, so you've got a red one, two white ones, and one stripy one. One is tall and thin, one short and fat. What do you mean like me, <laughs> cheeky thing? <laughs> and one's a birthday cake candle. No, it's not anybody's birthday. This is just to illustrate this, okay? So what have they all got in common? Apart from the fact they're all candles, they're all made of the same stuff. Yeah, made of wax. And they've all got a wick. Yeah. Have they got anything else in common? No. So they're all different. Yes? They can light up. They can light up. That's good, isn't it? They can all light up. And when we light them up, we see something really amazing. Can you help me on this one? Because um, I've got to hold out for you. It's a bit of a wriggle today. If you can just light those two. We're just going to light two of them, okay? And I want you to tell me if you notice anything special. What? Yeah. Um, and that one. That's good. Right. Okay. So they light up, they, they all light up, but we're not going to light them all. Um, this is called economy. Um, so what have they got in common, Alfie? I know they've got a flame, but what about the flame? Do you know what to say anything about the flame? Yeah? Yeah, that one's a little bit taller than that, isn't it? Now you think a little candle would have a little flame and a big candle would have a big flame. It's sort of the other way around. And um, tell you what, we'll blow them up because uh, they're going to burn away if we don't and besides Abigail might grab them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> can we, let me tell you a little story. Do you want a little story? Yes, it's got a happy ending. It was one day, and Jesus had been really, really busy. People had been coming and going all day, and he was really tired. Do you know, sometimes we think Jesus could do anything, and he could. But he got tired and hungry, just like we do. Sometimes he got sad like we do as well. And he'd been really busy this day, and he was really, really tired. The people were starting to go away when suddenly some new people came. There were some ladies and they had little children with them. And they came up to Jesus' friends, his disciples, and said, we've brought the children, we'd like them to see Jesus. And do you know what the disciples said? Oh, can't do that. No, 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 no. go away, go away. He's too busy. He's been dealing with important people today. He's got no time for these little children. 
How do you think they felt? How do you think they felt? Sad. Yeah. You feel sad sometimes. Yeah. And they turned and started walking away with their little children when suddenly Jesus saw them and he said, Stop! Come back! He said, Bring the children here. And he picked them up. A bit like you're being picked up now. He gave them a cuddle and he talked to them and he blessed them. And he turned to his disciples and he said, Don't ever send children away. This is what my kingdom is all about. Unless you come to me like a little child, you can't be part of my father's kingdom. And sometimes, you know, we look at children and we think, they're only little. They're not important. But they are. Even the littlest one. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> And sometimes the littlest ones can give off the biggest light. We're told to shine like lights. And sometimes we think it's the important people that have the brightest light. The ones who are in prominent places. Sometimes it's what we think is unimportant gives the best light. And you know, there's a lesson there for all of us. We all need to shine for God. But sometimes we can learn a lot from little children. Because they're important. Jesus said so. You like that, do you? You've got a question for me. What's the question? Yeah, I can see the cake on the table. <laughs> can you eat it later? I'll see Okay. You're going to go back to sleep. Okay, fine. Let's put you back here. Right. Okay, boys and girls are going to go out in just a moment. Before we do, we're just going to sing another song to together. All the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside?
think you're all conscious that we're on the last day of the year. And uh, tomorrow, a New Year's Day, 2024. Seems only the other day we were saying 2023, and suddenly the year's gone. It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Janus, that's what January is named after. The Roman god Janus, and Janus is pictured with having two faces, one looking forward and one looking back. The one looking forward is often depicted as a young face. The one looking back is a more mature face. It's very, very common at times like this as we look into the new year to make plans, to make New Year's resolutions. But it's often a time for reflecting, for remembering. This morning I want to look, speak on two titles, Remember and Forget. It might sound like a paradox, but I hope it will become clear as we go along. Remember. They say when you get older, you reminisce more. Uh, and I find it doing, I, I find myself doing it an awful lot with my grandchildren. You know, they, they come along and they're talking about the latest iPhone and so on. And inevitably I say, when I was your age, I didn't have a phone at all of any sort. And they look at me as though I'm 210 years old. Perhaps they think that's the way I am. Who knows? We do reminisce. We do remember when we were younger or young. There are many times in the Bible where God calls his people to remember. He tells them to remember the Passover. Right to this day, the Jewish people celebrate Passover. And when they do, they remember the time when they came out of slavery in Egypt. They also celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, a reminder of the days that the nation were wandering in the wilderness. If you look in the Psalms and other parts of the Bible, there's often a repeated reminisce of the whole history of the people of Israel. And Israel are being continually reminded, this is where you've come from. Remember it. Tell your children about it. Make it part of your heritage. And that's a good thing to do. But then when we turn to the prophecy of Isaiah, we read these words. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. It's Isaiah 43. Sounds like a bit of a contradiction. One moment God is telling the nation, don't forget. And then he's saying, don't dwell on the past, forget about it. What's it all about? I'll try and explain it as we go along. The prophecy of Isaiah is quite an interesting book. Some people have called it a mini Bible. You know, if you look, at Isaiah and compare it to the Bible, there are some interesting comparisons. Now, of course, the original Bible, when it was first written, Old Testament and New Testament, it didn't have what we've got in chapter headings and all the verses so you can find the bit that you're looking for. It was just one continual scroll. I've actually got an Old Testament in Hebrew on a scroll back home, which I use in school. And uh, it's just roll after roll of just writing. There's, there's no headings or anything like that. But many years ago, they divided it up to make it easier for study and for reference. And the way they did it is quite fascinating. You see, the Bible itself has 66 books. And Isaiah, when it was divided up, has 66 chapters. In those 66 books in the Bible, there are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Isaiah divides up very neatly into 39 chapters and 27 chapters. 
When you look at the context of those chapters, the Old Testament largely speaks about the judgment of God. God is warning people. Now, mixed in a little bit like um, jewels in a crown, there, there are little bits where God speaks about his kindness, about his protection, about his love. But the main theme of the Old Testament is a warning about judgment. The first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah is largely about God's judgment. Then when we come to the New Testament, the main message there is God's salvation, what God has done to save us and give us a future. That's general. There are warnings and warnings of judgment as well mixed in, but the main theme is that of God's salvation and how it came to us. And the second 27 books of Isaiah, from chapter 40 to 66, is about God's salvation. There's lovely parallels there. Now, that's just an outline. We're not, we're not going to dwell on that. We're going to look at what was happening at the time when Isaiah was alive. Isaiah lived in the 8th century BC. And at the time, if we get a map of the, the, the area at that time, Israel is this little bit over here. There's Jerusalem and the kingdom of Israel there and the kingdom of Judah down there. The main force that was around in those days was Assyria. That was the superpower. That was the Russia or the USA of its day. And Assyria was threatening. It was expanding its borders. It had already invaded the northern kingdom, taken over Samaria, its capital. And now it was beginning to threaten Jerusalem and the kingdom of Judah. But during the, the, the prophecy of Isaiah, we find that the kingdom of, of Assyria was beginning to collapse. If you read the latter part of the first part of Isaiah, that's round about chapters 37, 38, 39, we find there Assyria was on the wane. The kings were being defeated. And there was a new superpower appearing, that of Babylon. Now Babylon was going to be a huge threat to Jerusalem. They were going to come in and utterly destroy Jerusalem and the temple. So just to sum up, Isaiah prophesying in the 8th century BC, um, Israel was under threat from Assyria, but there were also religious and social problems in the land of Israel. Now again, going back to the division in Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39, as well as being warnings of judgment, there was also warnings that if they didn't obey God, God would send them into exile in Babylon. And this actually happened, but after the days of Isaiah. Isaiah warned about it, and after Isaiah was gone, it happened. But then when we come to the second part of Isaiah, and this is fascinating, the latter chapters from chapter 40 to 66 is a message for people returning from exile. Now, the exile wasn't going to happen for another hundred years. And they were going to be in exile for 70 years. So we, we're looking at almost 200 years after these words were written. Isaiah gives them a message. A message that God would deliver them and bring them back from exile. <clears throat> now just picture the scene. These people were taken by King Nebuchadnezzar, carried off into exile. They were there for 70 years and by this time they were starting to be comfortable. And this time, a long, long time in the future from Isaiah, the message comes, you can return. You can go back to the land you came from. But there are a lot of reasons not to return. Number one, they were comfortable there. They'd made a life. They'd settled down. They had a family. They had homes. And as they looked ahead, there was a long, hard journey. On top of that, there wasn't really anything to go to back in Israel. 
Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem, burnt it to the ground. They practiced a burnt earth policy. They burnt everything and destroyed everything. So there was nothing for the people to return to. And as we look at the return from Babylon to Jerusalem, they would have gone one of two ways, either straight across the desert, which would have been a hard, difficult journey, or along the trade routes up to Haran and back down. But we're talking here of hundreds of miles of journey. And people were saying, we don't want to do it. We'd rather stay here. We like it here. And that's where Isaiah 43 comes in. You see, when God is telling them to forget the former things, don't dwell on the past, to a lot of the people of Israel, the past held a lot of bad memories. There was the destruction of their homes, the destruction of the temple, being carried away captive, being in a strange land. And God says, forget all that. Put it behind you. And God goes on to say, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God says, I'm going before you. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, I don't want this just to be a history lesson. This is very interesting. Well, I find it interesting. But how does it affect us? Here we are in 2023, just pushing into 2024. How can something that happened nearly 3,000 years ago have any relevance to us? Well, people haven't changed. I said at the start that we often reminisce, we remember what's gone by, and I do this a lot. Is that good or bad? There is a danger of remembering. First of all, we can just live in the past, wishing for the good old days. I remember when I was young, there wasn't all this problem around. Yes, there was. We just don't think about it. But it's easy to live in the past. Whereas we're living in the, future, in the present and looking to the future. The same applies to church. We can do things because we've always done them. Sometimes God takes us on new roads for new experiences. And whether it's collectively as a congregation or whether it's individually in our lives, in our homes, in our communities, sometimes God has got a purpose for us. And he will take us along a different route, a different path, a different experience. Are we ready to explore that? Sometimes the problem of living in the past is that we can become stagnant. We can become so used to what we're doing. And I'm talking about our everyday life. That we don't grow as a person. Or sometimes, like the people of Israel in captivity, we can remember the old regrets, things that we made a mess of, things that we did wrong. And yes, they come back to me as well. Things I wish I'd done differently. But you know, we can't change the past. Whether it's happy memories, whether it's regrets for mistakes we've made, or whether it's just memories of what we've done. That is past. And there is 
a need to look forward. New Year's Day. The time for New Year's resolutions. You know, I look upon New Year's resolutions with a bit of cynicism because the best resolutions usually fall flat within a couple of weeks. There's only one New Year's resolution that I kept. It was made more than 30 years ago and I kept it. And I made that resolution to do something for life. And I kept it. And that was to read the Bible, the Word of God, through once every year. And every year so far, thankfully, I've been able to keep it. This year, I'm three chapters behind. I've got a bit of catching up to do before midnight tolls tonight. But resolutions, they usually fall flat. Why? Because the best intentions, unless we have a determined plan, are only hopes. You know the sort of thing that people want to do. More exercise, get fitter, lose weight, give up smoking, cut down drinking. All these things that people want to make themselves better to make themselves into the person they think they should be. But somehow we never get there. The big question is, how far ahead do we plan? What I mean by that is, the trouble with New Year's resolutions is that it's looking at that year. Now, if I can just take this a little bit further, I spoke about the resolution I made 30 odd years ago and I determined then to be disciplined and to have a plan that would last not just for a week or a month or a year but forever to go on and on and on every year. And my, my vision was for the long term and that helped enormously. Sometimes we can plan, our plan is too short, too nearsighted. What is God's plan for you? What does God want you to do? First of all, God wants you to be His. You know, God's plan is for eternity. Our plans are just for time just for what we can perceive but God has eternity in view now I can't understand eternity I can't understand the beginning or end of time but God can he's the creator of it and God's purpose for you is an eternal one and what God did to bring that plan to fulfillment was to send his beloved son into the world. We just remembered it at Christmas time. I know it's hard to understand that that little baby lying in a manger was the fulfillment of what God purposed for you and for me. That little baby who would grow up to be a boy, a youth, a man. To live a life of humility and obscurity then as he started going around teaching he would heal and help and care for people he could stand at the grave of a, a loved one who had died and weep he could feel compassion for those who are in need he could move through the community with understanding and the Lord Jesus Christ as he lived amongst us he demonstrated to us fully what God's love really means. Ah, but the real plan, the real purpose which had been formulated way back in eternity, the plan for you and me,
took place just outside Jerusalem. As he, the one who had gone around doing good, the one who was kind and loving and helpful, was taken by the hands of man and nailed to a cross. It was an ugly scene. And as the Lord Jesus hung there, his body torn by the whips, his brow pierced by the thorns, his hands and feet nailed to a cross, his words were those of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Ah, but something more is going to happen. For as he hung there for three hours, from the brightest time of the day until about three o'clock in the morning, there came a darkness over the earth. There God lifted up his hand against the Lord Jesus Christ and he took all of the things that we've done wrong, all of our sin, all of the filthiness of the world, all the things that separate us from a holy God. And he placed that upon his beloved son. There the Lord Jesus Christ took our punishment. And that was God's <coughs> eternal plan for you and me. So what does it mean to us? What did the Lord Jesus Christ achieve that day for you and me today in the 21st century? Let's look at the words of the Lord Jesus himself. He could say, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly or have life to the full. Isn't that what people are looking for? A life that is meaningful, a life that is full, a life that is satisfying. That's what he came to bring us. Firstly, by dealing with our sin so we could be brought back to him. but then by drawing us into that wonderful relationship. What does 2024 mean to us? How can we have a life that is better, more meaningful, more exciting, more fulfilling, more satisfying? By exploring that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, by knowing him, by living with him day by day, by allowing him to lead, to guide, to control what we do, what we say, what we think, by making him the purpose for our lives. Of course, a relationship needs to be worked at. Whether it's a uh, a relationship we have within our home or a relationship with our neighbours or a relationship with a holy God it needs to be worked at. Can I challenge you today as we step into 2024 to make this not your New Year's resolution but your long-term purpose that you will endeavour to know God better, to know Jesus better, to allow him to be Lord in your life, to allow him to lead you. We need to remember, we need to learn from the past, but we also need to forget and lay aside all that we think we might have achieved and allow Jesus to be Lord. It says on the wall behind me, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May he be that in our lives for the coming year. May God bless you and may God help each one of us to give him first place. 
Shall we just bow and speak to God in prayer before we close? Gracious Father, we thank you that you have ordered our days. You know how many days we have to live and you know all about us. Father, with things that are so unknown to us, we thank you that we can trust you, that we can place our hand into yours and step forward into the new year with confidence, knowing that you go before us, knowing that you are Lord of all, knowing that you care for us. Help us, Father, to seek to make that relationship with you something real, something lasting, something that will change our lives for your glory. Be with us now, Father, as we come to the close. May your presence go with us as we ask your parting blessing in the name and for the glory of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being here. May God bless you and may I wish you all a happy and blessed new year. May God go with you. Thank you.